Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone, and let me let's stop the share so we can. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our virtual a virtual book reading and conversation with Dr. Sarah Ray. Um, my name is Lania Quinn Davison. I am an area fire advisor for University of California Cooperative Extension up in the north coast of California. And Sarah is a professor of environmental studies here at Humboldt State University. Um, so as we speak, we're both sitting in our homes um, just a few miles apart from one another. Um, some of you may know Sarah. I see a lot of folks from Humboldt County logging in. But for those of you who don't, I can tell you that Sarah is a very accomplished scholar who landed in Humboldt County after studying and teaching all over the country, including in Texas, Oregon, and in Alaska. Um, Sarah's authored several other books prior to this one that we'll hear about today, including one called The Ecological Other, Environmental Exclusion in American Culture. Um, for me, this webinar is more personal. Sarah is one of my closest friends here in Humboldt and someone I met about five and a half years ago at a Halloween party um, where we were both strapped with little babies and, uh, and sleepless nights and immediately drawn to each other. Um, for years, we've really relished each other's friendships, and we've had lots of, of deep conversations, usually late at night when our kids are asleep, usually over wine. <laughs> and um, we've really enjoyed sharing and understanding each other's work. Me focused on all things fire, and Sarah really focused on environmental and social justice. And for years, we've hatched plans of how we might make our careers overlap. And finally, we're here. Um, so you're witnessing the first real confluence of our friendship and our professional lives, which is really exciting for both of us. Um, I've for years thought that Sarah's work on climate change really had relevance and potential influence for my work in FIRE. And uh, this was especially palpable this winter during the fires in Australia um, when, you know, the whole world was, was reeling over the losses we were seeing. And uh, the connections to climate change and, and politics were very clear and very real. So now with the COVID crisis in full force, I think Sarah's work on climate anxiety is even more pertinent than ever. So um, thanks for joining me for, to hear about her new book and to learn some more about some of these coping strategies that she's been researching and developing for over a decade. Um, this is a really powerful topic. Clearly, it's very global. We have folks logged in from 13 different countries, including all over Europe and North America, as well as Australia, South Africa, and Pakistan. Um, we also have people from 35 different U.S. states who registered for this webinar. So really impressive turnout, and um, it's just clear how important the work that Sarah is doing is to all of us. So thank you for being here. Um, the way we're structuring this is Sarah really wanted it to be more conversational than a presentation, so we're doing it kind of interview style. Um, you can imagine us sitting around some evening talking about our work. That's kind of what we're going for as we hear about this new book. Um, there is a Q&A panel or a Q&A box where you can ask questions. So please you, feel free to use the chat for general comments or for communicating with other participants um, or, or to communicate with the panelists. But if you want to ask a question, please enter it in the Q&A box. Um, the webinar is being recorded for future viewing and for sharing. So if you know folks who um, who want to watch this later, I will be sending out the, the link to the recording um, soon after the webinar. So let's go ahead and get started. And uh, welcome, Sarah. So good to see your face. It's been too long <laughs> since we've seen yeah. each other in person. Yeah, it's wonderful so, to see your face. And thank you so much for doing this, Lainey. It's a real labor of love. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it is a joy. Um, so let's start off with you telling us a little bit about climate anxiety, because your book is, is full of references to it, but some of us might not even know what that is or what you mean by that. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the feeling of climate anxiety is something that, when I used to give this talk to other audiences before COVID, I used to sort of 
provide evidence of it, right? To sh show people that it existed and that there was evidence of it in the world. And so I would use evidence like, for example, the David Buckel, the person who immolated himself in New York over climate change and climate anxiety and his message to the world that fossil fuels were killing us. And so that's what he did to himself. And it was super alarming. And uh, the depression of people like the photojournalist and um, documentarian Chris Jordan and his environmental depression that he experienced a severe depression after he did all the documenting of the albatross on the Midway Atoll. Um, the, the death and destruction that, that many people on the front lines of science who are documenting extinctions and different kinds of environmental change are experiencing a lot of uh, depression and anxiety about what they're observing. And so people in different pockets have been finding out information around climate anxiety and eco grief and different types of words for just different kinds of um, uh, anxiety about what's on the horizon. And I used to sort of roll out evidence of this to get people to then be able to go through the rest of my talk about what to do about it. <laughs> and in this moment, it seems unnecessary <laughs> to do that. And, uh, and even more necessary now maybe perhaps is to really bring forth and lift up the connections between what we're experiencing now and climate change. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But climate anxiety is different from it's super important, I think, to uh, parse out the different types of feelings that people are having around climate change and environmental change. One of the things that people might be feeling is, is direct fear, right? Fear is something that's right in front of you. And these different kinds of feelings that people have with different words around them are, are culturally contextual, right? They, happen, they have to do with the kinds of um, economic and, and geographic situation that you're in. So fear might be something that's directly in front of you, a threat that's really immediate, and it's sort of triggering your limbic system into fight, flight, or freeze, and you're having that kind of immediate, I have to get out of here situation, and your prefrontal cortex or your thinking side of your mind has a hard time ra rationalizing what the right action should be. Whereas anxiety is a kind of a low-grade background uh, feeling that has to do with a future or anticipatory threat, right? And so mostly climate change has been in that category, which is why um, I wanted to really pull out in the title the ways that climate anxiety is a sort of unique thing compared to other kinds of anxiety, but it is similar in that it's about a future anticipatory worry. And I still think that that's very true. And the, the funny thing or the, the weird paradoxes around climate change and people's feelings about it, many people have documented this and studied this, that climate change by its very diff definition, because it's about climate, is something that people have a hard time getting their heads around and perceiving. And some people have even said that it's sort of like the worst problem to get people to mobilize around because it's a, it just does not conjure up the kinds of fears that people need to feel like doing something or having behavior change or moving, mobilizing major public will around like we're seeing happening right now with COVID. And so when Greta Thunberg made that speech in Davos where she said, I want you to all feel like your house is on fire, what she's trying to do is say, everybody should be feeling about climate change, this amorphous threat in the future that people don't really know how it's gonna manifest and so they can't really do anything about. And it also feels connected to so many different things and so it feels too big to do anything about or inevitable, so therefore it's hard to do anything about. But she was saying, no, your house is on fire, you can do something about this and you need to do it right now as if it's an immediate threat. And that is a rhetorical move that she's trying to make to bring climate change out of this amorphous, unfeeling space of future, maybe never going to happen feeling to right in front of our faces. And I think that that's a really important moment that we're seeing right now with COVID. We are now acting like our house is on fire finally around climate change. Um, and it's interesting that um, the way it manifested kind of prior to COVID with my students and with people I talk to about this, you know, I've been researching this now for four or five years and it's all we talk about. It's, I live in this world of talking about what are these different feelings and how are people feeling about this? Um, and climate anxiety at that time was sort of this, um, it's really ca captured by my students' sense that they can't do anything in the face of such a big problem. And so they are sort of um, set up to this state and this, hist this future of their lives that's going to be extremely uncertain. They don't know what ground to stand on. They don't know what to do with their hopes and dreams and careers and, and family planning and whether or not they're going to be able to ever retire like their parents are and all kinds of 
sense that maybe capitalism won't be there anymore and maybe cars won't be there anymore and what will life be like, right? And so there's, there's climate anxiety with, with young people, especially because my book is really geared towards young people and I'm really thinking about my students when I'm thinking about, when I'm talking about these things. Um, and my students at Humboldt State turned out to be a real, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A real emblematic um, kind of beacon or a, or a symbol of what really happened in the last year with the youth climate marches around the world. 1.4 million young people marching for climate strikes and, you know, inspired in part by Greta Thunberg's words. But the, the fact that this was sort of happening and, and brewing in the last, you know, five or so years in my own classrooms didn't, made me not surprised at all that this was happening with the youth climate march and the anxiety that they feel. And you can see on some of their posters things like that, you can see the evidence of that kind of anxiety, right? You can't, um, don't tell us that we're going to be okay. You know, you get to retire after extracting oil for your whole life and we're, we're not going to do that. So what do, what do you have to offer us, right? Or things like, I can't go to school. I don't care about going to school if I don't even have a future. Um, so these kinds of comments are really captured, I think, also in this recent meme that just came around that I really love and I have to, I have to lift it up here, a meme that says, the way that boomers feel about, or sorry, boomers, the way that boomers feel about the generation of the baby boomers feel about COVID, which is, of course, real, they're really worried because COVID is partic particularly dangerous for vulnerable people of older ages. So the way baby boomers feel about COVID is the way that Generation Z feels about climate change. And so that sense of um, asking people to perceive different kinds of threats in different ways that is different across generational lines is super fascinating and we're going to see climate change perhaps I hope moving into more of a kind of a COVID fear as people start to really tease out how these connections are being made um, and I wanted to just um, if it's okay I'll intersperse my answers to your questions with some with some little bits from my book just to give you a flavor of how the, the tone of the book is really trying to be written for for the climate generation okay so this is an answer to your question about what's what is climate anxiety one of my students, Maddie, some of you might know her, wrote a paper about her environmental values, about how her environmental values led to such severe self-loathing, eco-guilt, that she stopped consuming much at all, including food. Taking zero impact to its nihilistic endgame, she reduced her footprint by literally reducing the physical space she took up. At a grocery store, when she could not decide on a purchase that would not, quote, somehow contribute to ecological, social, and personal health problems, she would leave without food altogether, deciding that it was better to go hungry than to make the wrong decision. Maddie thought, and she wrote this in her final paper for my class, she writes, to disappear, to become smaller, was to be beautiful, and of course, a good environmentalist. Her conclusion was that the best environmentalists are the ones who disappear. Civil rights attorney and climate activist David Buckell went farther when in 2018, he immolated himself using gasoline. He claimed in his suicide note that ending his life represented what we're all doing to ourselves by relying on fossil fuels. The first climate suicide in the United States, Buckell's death signaled a new intensity in the emotional register of climate change advocacy. Examples of the toll exacted by climate change abound. Photographer Chris Jordan, who spent a year documenting Rayson Albatross dying on Midway Atoll, from ingesting plastic pollution, has spoken publicly about the depression the experience caused him. For one of my radio journalist colleagues, any mention of Al Gore or climate change is a trigger. He has to turn off the radio when NPR's daily report, Climate Connection, comes on. A viral YouTube video shows a nine-year-old breaking down hysterically when talking about the devastation of the planet. According to environmental science educator Ellen Kelsey, our worries about the environment affect us personally. She says, they influence what we choose to eat or how we get to work. They keep us awake at night. They make us grieve for the world we are leaving our grandchildren. They stop us from choosing to have kids. They trigger depression. Yet, she goes on to observe, there is a strange silence about the emotional impact of the ways in which we talk about the environment. We think nothing of inviting a scientist into a second grade classroom and telling the kids the planet is ruined. What's going on here? Between environmentalism's maxim, leave no trace, and the Church of Euthanasia's creepy slogan, Save the Planet, Kill Yourself, it is no surprise that environmentally conscious Americans suffer from a variety of existential ills, including guilt, depression, grief, and eating disorders. 
But Bagel's suicide introduced a new dangerous phase of extreme reaction to environmental disruption. The climate generation is particularly vulnerable to climate anxiety and its attendant ills. Getting informed about the psychological effects of specific to climate change, including pre-traumatic stress disorder, solastalgia, and eco-grief is the first step to overcoming them. Wow. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there are some comments coming in, um, so I just want you to note those because you might appreciate uh, looking at them. Um, can you share a little bit about the story behind your idea to write this book and kind of how you got, I know you did it on your sabbatical last year, um, but you had been leading up to it for a while. So, and who, who did you hope to reach with this book? Yeah, so I, the story behind this book is really a, a story of a complete shift in direction of my whole focus and career. Um, and it's been, uh, it has really opened up the doors to, um, some connections and networks and, and intensity of feeling and feeling like I'm tapped into really important work that I didn't ever expect in my career. So I'm just extremely grateful for it. Um, so what was happening was about five or so years ago, I, I've been leading environmental studies BA programs, both at University of Alaska Southeast. Um, shout out to all the Juno people there. I've seen some Juno people popping up. That's so exciting. Um, and I, that was a brand new program there when they opened up that program as a geography and environmental studies BA. And then I moved four years later to Arcata to help start Humboldt State's brand new environmental studies program in 2013. And in both of these cases, you know, there, you could sort of, there was a, a sense that our job as educators was to sort of inform students of all this content about how bad the problems were and how interconnected they were and how environmental problems are really connected with social justice problems and you can't deal with one without the other. And I felt like my job, or I, we all kind of, when you leave your PhD, you feel like your job is to share this knowledge and share these forms of analysis with your students and, and what they do with it and how they feel about it and how it affects their family life and how it affects their midnight dark nights of the soul is not, you know, was not my business and I didn't care about that. And um, that wasn't the point. And I think most of environmental messages and people in my generation who are environmental educators think that their job is to go around telling people how bad the problems are to get them to wake up. Well, I started to realize that about five years ago, young people were already coming in, woken up about this and they didn't the telling them more about how bad things were was not a, a useful strategy because it was backfiring. And so I get a lot of these late night emails and lots of office hour visits about the anguish that people were feeling and the despair and even apathy around not wanting, what's the point of even doing anything if the problems are so big and I'm so powerless, what is the point of even trying? And so they were, they came into college kind of idealistic about the ways that they're going to be furnished with all of these tools to go solve these problems. And they realize the problems are too big. They're not going to do anything about it. And so that despair and that kind of loss of innocence um, would really disrupt class time, <laughs> understandably so. You know, students would kind of hijack the content and say, but this, why does it even matter? You know, what should we even do about this? This is the premonition of what the school strikes started to say, right? Why are we even here? Um, and that, that disruption was, was also burning me out, right? So that I had to realize that what the effect of feeling like I needed to save my students from this despair and to make sure that they were happy and okay and feeling good about their education meant that I was actually burning myself out. And I, I had to also reckon with the fact that they were forcing me to reckon with my own climate anxiety because I was teaching this stuff and I was sort of merrily going around saying, yeah, it's awful. Go do something. Fix it. Um, and that caused me to uh, really think about, and I had this kind of pivotal conversation with a colleague where I was whining to her about uh, not having enough time to do my research anymore, my environmental justice research that I thought was so important because my students were so needy, existentially needy. And she said, that's, that's what we're all feeling. You should, you should study that. You should research that. And I thought that was just an amazing invitation, and I haven't turned back since. And really since then, I haven't really been successful at completely changing all the curriculum around to, to change these things, but I, because I, I, I'm sensitive to the fact that not all students want to sit there and talk about feelings when they're trying to solve environmental problems. Um, but what I have done is I have been way more thoughtful about the emotional 
um, outcomes of our, our assignments and thinking and researching a lot, which is what this book is about, what are the emotional states that we need to be in to engage in this work for the long haul? And what is that emotional state? Is it hope? Is it uh, resilience? What is it? And so I've been really studying all these different emotional aspects. Does guilt, how does guilt work? How does shame work? Is empathy a crucial feeling? What are all the different feelings that we're all having about this? And what are the ones that can, that we can learn to cultivate to try to um, engage, be able to be situated ourselves to engage in the work for the long haul? Because if we are in the right emotional states for long-term hard work, we aren't going to do it. And that doesn't serve the planet, which we ostensibly are all here to try to work with, right? So that was, that's the story of, of the, how I got to doing the book. And I wanted to, I know that my editor is on here. I saw Stacey Eisenstark and I want to give a shout out to the UC Press because really, truly, I had been a scholar and I had never written a mainstream book. I had never written a book for a younger audience. I never, nobody ever in my career had ever told me I should do that. And I was really called to attention, I think, in the 2016 U.S. presidential election to to think of myself, you know, I thought as an academic, what can academics do in the, in the face of what's going on? I mean, I felt very powerless, you know. Once again, we all have these moments of being like, I have no power to do anything about these terrible conditions. And I thought one thing that academics could do is become more public facing and really be responsible and accountable to the work that they're doing for the public. And so to find an editor in a press that really wanted to help me do that, they had to untrain all of my scholarly habits and they had to help me become a very different type of um, thinker, which was has been a real pleasure. Sarah, can you talk a little bit more about those emotional states? Um, as I've been reading your book, I, I was immediately drawn to the chapter on, on guilt, um, because I think guilt is used, I mean, you and I talk a lot about guilt um, and how it's used in various ways. But I'm I'm curious if you could just talk a little bit more about some about shame and guilt and some of those emotional states that we should strive for that are outside of those. Yeah. So um, the I'm I was hoping I could find the guilt section because I really enjoy um, that's a fun one to read, but I won't, I won't try to do that right now. Um, so the the feeling of the aspect of guilt or the emotion of guilt, it turns out that guilt doesn't activate the right part, the right kind of chemistry in our brains. And you have to understand, I'm, I'm going to concede right now that I'm not a psychologist or a neuroscientist. So I might talk about what I've learned and researched about those things in ways that psychologists who might be listening might um, say, that's not the right language. So forgive me, forgive me. But the idea that the chemistry in our brain, the science around what guilt uh, produces in our, in our behavior, our behavioral change, turns out to not be very long like long lasting, and that other kinds of emotions that are pleasurable are much more likely to do so. And so I have a section in my book called Less Stick, More Carrot. And the idea there being the, that negative feelings, I mean, we, we need to all recognize that negative feelings are part of life. And, and the more we embrace the negative feelings around anxiety about the future, the better we'll, equipped we'll be to, to cope with it. So I'm not suggesting that negative feelings are inherently always bad. But negative feelings do not motivate long-term behavior change, and we are not likely to stay in a behavior change that we do out of motivating motivating factor of guilt. And guilt also has the effect of, of it turns out people want to alleviate guilt more than they want to actually um, fix the problem that the guilt is making them want to fix. So if I have guilt about, like, for example, that story about Maddie, if I have guilt about what I'm consuming because it's going to affect some somebody down the line of, of, the, of the commodity chain or it's going to affect the planet in some way, that's not, that emotion of guilt, I'm more likely to just want to get rid of it than to actually fix what the problem is. And so it turns out that the engagement in, in fixing those problems is much better driven by pleasures, uh, emotions of things like pleasure and a sense of connection and a, sen a sense of um, moral you know, duty or, or feeling of feeling good about something, it has to feel pleasurable. Feelings of desire, for example, are much more effective for long-term change. And so it's, it's particularly destructive for the environmental movement, which has long operated and long deployed the emotion of guilt to get people to change behavior, to continue down this path. And I'm really calling on the environmental movement and environmental folks to ditch guilt, 
<laughs> one of my chapters called Bitch Guilt. Um, guilt is, you know, for most of us, uh, not going to include, in, involve the long-term change we need to, to engage in. And imagine, and imagine, so guilt also makes us want, you know, environmental movement asks us to sacrifice, right, to deny our pleasure. That's part of what people, why people don't like to be environmentalists, right? They're like, I don't want to deny consumption, and I don't want to not fly anymore, and these are pleasures for me, and I don't want to ride a bike, you know? And so the actions that are associated around environmental behavior seem to feel like self-denying actions. They see it comes from like a politics of scarcity or sacrifice. And most people, many people don't like that, which is why kind of environmentalism, especially in America, is a little bit doomed, right? So one of the things that we can do is to rethink and reframe environmental motivations and environmental rhetoric and arguments in terms of pleasure and desire and abundance and, and all the things you can have, right? And so that is a really important um, uh, an important underlying theory of the arguments in my book. How can we desire the future, right, instead of fear it? Oh, I love that. And there's actually a question in the um, in the Q and A box that I'm I'm generally going to wait on the questions in the Q and A until our discussion at the end, just so everyone knows. Um, but if I see one that's particularly pertinent to what Sarah's talking about, I'm going to bring it up. And um, the very first question that got asked was, do you believe that feeling fear is the motivation needed to drive change? Yeah, so it can, it, it ha it's very effective. And so researchers have shown that fear is a very strong motivator for behavior change. I mean, that's just a fact. And it does make us move in a different direction right away. But it doesn't have the it, it, fear itself because of the way it operates in the chemistry in our brains. It doesn't actually allow us to do to think and reason about which direction we need to now go in. And so, unfortunately, what I worry about with the COVID situation is that the fear is driving this change. So this is really positive. Look, people can mobilize quickly around fear, and and do really radical things. I mean, we are we are moving resources and political will and culture so fast right now that it's, it's dizzying. But operating, that, operating out of fear for the long term is going to do exactly what you're starting to see happening with the protests around liberating different states from, from um, shelter in place orders. And so fear as a, as a long term emotion can actually result in irrational behavior that is not in people's self-interest and it certainly can be deployed and has been and already is around actual violence right so you see uh incredible spike in violence against people of asian american descent or chinese american descent in the u.s and that fear is is usually what's operating behind um the way that we react to fear can also be really repressive and so in the in the long term thinking about how what lessons covid could teach us about how to prepare for climate change really we need to be engaging this question of fear and the politics of fear and how it's not if, if we operate on politics of fear around covid we're not going to be using covid as a way to prepare for climate change it will be a real shame that is really interesting yeah um i guess Let's jump into talking about some of the coping strategies that you outline in your book, because that really is the, the bulk of your book and the purpose is to help give us some tools. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of the comments and questions and, you know, people are relating to the anxiety you're talking about, but, um, but what are some of the things you can offer us to help with that? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna read just the table of contents because each of the chapters is about one of these strategies. And so, and then I'm going to do a little bit of reading from the book itself around specific, um, some specific strategies. And so in the book, there's actually seven, seven strategies. Um, and I'll read the titles of them now. The conclusion is also a strategy too, but I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. So the strategies to cope with climate anxiety that I outline, um, by the way, I wanted to point out that Many books around climate change and sustainability are kind of how to become more sustainable in your life. So many books will talk about, you know, reducing this or that or changing some habits in your household or that sort of thing, and or even engaging in politics in different ways. Um, those, this is not that book. Those are, there's so many of those you can pick up. I have some of my favorites and they're out there and, and I, I, that was not what I wanted to write. 
I wanted to write a book that really answered the call that some folks like Jen Bendel and um, um, Do Rob, Bob Doppelt and Joanna Macy and folks were calling for really thinking about what are going to be the interior existential strategies that we're going to need to do that work for the long haul. To me, that seems like the foundation for any of the other stuff. And I didn't feel like I had any tools for that. And I didn't, and I was suffering without them. And I really felt that my students were. So one is to get schooled on the role of emotions in climate justice work. And so the very first premise of this book is, you know, instead of acting out of fear, learn about how different emotions um, affect the different kinds of ways that we behave and act and how they can help us, how we can use them to help us engage in the work for the long haul. The second is to cultivate climate wisdom. And in this chapter, I'm really thinking about how it is that um, becoming wise about ourselves and about what we're doing on this planet, it's, it gets maybe like bordering on spiritual in that chapter, but there's a sense of whether it's secular or spiritual, that there's a, a level of um, kind of existential wisdom that is going to be required to accept the severity of what's going on and still be able to find pleasure in your day. The third chapter is claim your calling and scale your action. And in this chapter, I'm really thinking about how it is that um, Amer in America in particular, I was raised, or at least in Western culture, I was raised as uh, really in this myth of the individual and not really recognizing that my actions operate within a wide web of people acting and that my own life and my own state and my own merit was all that mattered and that I needed to make spectacular impact if I was gonna have any impact at all. And I think especially what students have held up a mirror to me about is that we are, we are not, you know, if we, if we think of ourselves as operating as individuals, we will always burn out. We will always never be enough. We will always feel powerless on the scale of what's going on. But guess what? That's been happening in social change for a long time. And so researching how people who have engaged in social change for a long time, different social movements like Gandhi and Martin Luther King and um, and I really love Rebecca Solnit's work on this. The, the notion that we are individuals in a, in a, battle, a big battle um, and therefore we can't do anything has been something people have been grappling with and so we can really learn from them. Um, the fourth chapter is called Hack the Story. And in this chapter, I really think about how important it is that we are very critical and we become um, really thoughtful about how the stories that we live in and consume and disseminate ourselves what kinds of effects they have on our emotional states and, what, and whether they, they enable us to get up in the morning to engage in work or whether they make it really difficult. And so this is where I talk about how um, it, it's just really helpful to know that mainstream media and social media are trying to get us to think that we live in a world that's unfolding into chaos. And it's not that those things maybe not be true. There is some awful stuff out there and I'm not denying it. But to spend your life in, in this headspace of what the media wants to do, the media wants to tap into our fear instinct because that's what keeps us coming back for these dopamine hits of, of shock and alarm and fear. And we can control that. We have power over what, what stories we live in and what stories we consume. And so that chapter is really about how important it is to cult, really be thoughtful and imaginative about the story you're going to create for yourself and the stories that you, you want to hear about the world. The fifth chapter is called Be Less Right and More in Relation. And in this chapter, I talk about how we're so inclined and so trained by current divisive politics, especially in the U.S., to, um, to call out, do a lot of calling out, and to have some sort of like self-righteous sort of division between in politics. And we're seeing this play out all the time. And I think I, I hear a lot of students when they come into classes just super angry, and anger is a one, a very effective and important emotion. And I'm not dismissing anger, but to be to operate out of a place of anger will will actually just destroy us, right, for the long term. And anger has a place, and it generates really great politics. But I find, especially with young people, anger can result to the fraying of their relationships and their sense of greater, even greater isolation. And so in this chapter, I, I really argue and I build on a lot of research that talks about the, the huge importance of community in um, building personal and collective resilience around climate change. And so I, I try to prioritize community and trust building and social capital over things like 
being right and being right in an argument. And, you know, even if we win the next election, that's only another four to eight years and the climate needs a lot longer than that. And so the long-term work of changing hearts and minds is far more important and we need relationships to be kept intact in order to do that. Um, so the sixth chapter is move beyond hope, ditch guilt and laugh more. And I talked a little bit about that chapter already. Um, and then the seventh chapter is called Resist Burnout. And in this chapter, I talk about how common it is for um, people who are engaged in climate advocacy and work actually sort of wear burnout as a badge of honor and, and how it's super hard to undo some of those habits. And then the final, the conclusion is called Feed What You Want to Grow. And Feed What You Want to Grow is uh, the mantra that has been sort of helping me get through my own acute anxiety right now. Um, we, we want to spend all of our time and energy and attention on the things that are causing us that immediate fear right in front of our faces. And um, that chapter talks about what happens when you direct your attention to the things that you love. And, you know, the, the fear I'm feeling around COVID and the fear I feel about climate comes from, if we sit, if I examine my emotions, it comes from a, a, the love of something, right? My love of something that I don't want to be threatened by something like climate change or COVID. And so the idea there is to focus the attention on, on what that which I love rather than that which I fear threatening the thing I love. So I just wanted to give you a, a flavor of um, one of the sections that I asked one of my students to tell me which, which part of the book they thought was the best because I didn't know which ones to read you all. I, I love it all, obviously. Um, so she was she pointed out the section on powerlessness is an illusion. And so I'm just going to read a, a section on powerlessness as an illusion. Okay. The concept of pseudo inefficacy, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. Pseudo inefficacy, which means we think we're not powerful, right? We feel we're powerless, illustrates how we come to think of ourselves as powerless. Pseudo inefficacy is a way of thinking that we can have little positive impact on the world, which in turn shapes our decisions about where we will devote our energies. In a thought experiment described by philosopher Peter Singer in The Drowning Child and the Expanding Circle, Singer asked his students if, he, if they would feel an obligation to save a child who was drowning in a pond they were walking by. They unanimously said they would. He then widens the circle asking if they would feel an obligation to save a child in another country who was at equal risk of death, of death, at which point they became more hesitant. From there, he goes on to raise questions about our moral responsibilities for the lives of others. Cognitive and conservation psychologists, Daniel Vassal, Paul Slovic, and Marcus Mayorga pose a new question. Suppose as you see the child go under, you also see in the distance another child beginning to drown, one you cannot reach. Would you be then less motivated to rescue the child within your reach? Their research suggests that because it would not be possible to help both, people are less likely to attempt to save even the first child. This makes no rational sense. Isn't the incentive, the benefit of a life saved, the same in both cases? Vassal and colleagues use the poet Zygmunt Herbert's phrase, arithmetic of compassion, Arithmetic of, excuse me, arithmetic of compassion to describe how the positive feelings of saving a child are canceled by the negative feelings of knowing that others cannot be saved. In other words, the desire to help fades when we realize we can't help everyone who needs it. For those in position to offer assistance, decisions are strongly motivated by perceived inefficacy. Inefficacy, real or perceived, shrivels compassion and response. Feeling like you don't have power to do good will deflate your desire to even try. It follows that one's efficacy or one's confidence, confidence in their ability to solve a problem is more likely to determine whether one even attempts to solve the problem. More than having marketable skills or being armed with information and arguments, believing in your efficacy will influence whether you try to solve problems. This is the premise of this book, and I cannot overstate how key this concept is for all the arguments I make here. It will affect how much stress and depression you experience in threatening situations, which in turn affects your motivation to do anything about that situation. Perceived rather than actual efficacy is often the determinant of behavior, Vassal, Slovic, and Mayorga argue. The problem of pseudo-inefficacy, they continue, is central to a wide range of important personal and societal decisions motivated by perceived efficacy, 
such as actions to mitigate climate change or other threats to health, human health and the environment. In other words, thinking of ourselves as ineffectual in our ability to address climate change makes us so. So that was, that's one of my sort of arguments to combat our feelings of powerless. I have many in that chapter because that's my pet peeve. That's why I can't understate it more. Um, and then um, here's another argument about, excuse me, argument about the importance of finding, finding our passion and finding our calling in the work. You don't need to love animals or even like being in nature to make a difference in addressing climate justice. It's not a prerequisite to helping save the planet that you be good at math or love gardening. You don't even have to be more powerful than you already are. You can start simply by identifying and using the powers that you have. Whether we are artivists or trauma therapists or students or stay-at-home dads, whether we are reducing emissions, the science side, or working on voter suppression, gerrymandering, or toxic citing, the social justice side, we have the capacity to address the social structures that create environmental injustice and aggravate climate change. The front, lines, the front lines are the books we choose to read our children, the pipeline being laid across our land, the social capital we foster among our coworkers at McDonald's, the cli-fi novel that we've been fantasizing about writing, the campaign to elect a pollution-fighting candidate, meditating or listening compassionately to someone with whom we disagree. Climate justice needs all kinds of help. Scientists are only one part of the groundswell, just as we are each only one part. If the problem of climate change is wickedly complicated, we will need people everywhere and with every type of skill. Following one of my favorite scholars, Adrian Marie Brown, we should know that uprisings and resistance and mass movement require a tolerance of messiness a tolerance of many, many paths being walked on at once. What path will you walk? Wow, <laughs> this is Yana Valakovic. I'm in the background here, and I see we just had a little bit of a, a tech issue um, that just happened. So I think Lania is going to be coming back on in just a second. So uh, I'm going to pick up here. Um, so. You know, Sarah, what advice do you have for the climate generation? How, how should we be talking to both our kids? Um, you know, maybe maybe a little bit about how do you break it down into kind of different age groups, and how do you manage the message for for kids at different ages? And when do you start the introduction of that conversation? Yeah, that's such a great question. And this is, um, I, I strongly believe that talking to young adults and talking to people who are on the precipice of adulthood and experiencing that rite of passage uh, is a really different thing than talking to second graders. And then I quoted that, that wonderful person who I, I've learned so much from, Ellen Kelsey, who says, we don't think twice about sending scientists into second grade classrooms and, and young kids learning about the devastation of the planet. And, and they're, they're left to infer what their future is going to look like at that age. And I think that there is an age appropriateness to be talking about these things. And I also think, again, to, to go back to my point earlier, it's extremely important that environmentalists change the rhetorical strategy depending on their audience. And if we assume that what we need to do is scare people into caring, we're going to also scare people into apathy and denial. My name is that guy. <laughs> and so, my, so I strongly believe that there's a different way that we should be talking about this across different ages and also across different audiences in general. Um, knowing your audience is a super important part of any kind of environmental argument. And this kind of goes to, into my chapter about be less right and more in relation. In that chapter, one of the things I talk about, and I quote Catherine Hayhoe a lot here, and she's an evangelical climate scientist. And so she has sort of always having to go into these evangelical right-wing settings and talk about climate change. And so she's really adept at figuring out how to make, to connect the dots between what people are really expressing as their concerns and worries and what, what she's trying to um, explain about climate change. And I think that the aware, ability to adjust your message and adjust the way you talk about climate change depending on your audience is one of the things that we really need to do better at. And that's what that chapter is about, developing that skill or developing that one could call it empathy, but I actually sort of reject empathy in my book, so I won't use that word, but it's an awareness of your audience and a, and a, a compassion for where your audience is at and where they, what they're caring about. And um, for young people, one of the things that I think is super 
something that we need to be doing. One of the reasons why I wrote the book for young people is because I don't think that they're getting the message in enough places in their lives that that the, the fact that they are worried about the viability of life on the planet. They're not just worried about student debt. They're not just worried about how to get to college. They're not just worried about the economics or the current political situation or all of the background noise that's happening with, um, with Generation Z. Generation Z is the most depressed, lonely, and suicidal in history. Generation Z is also the most ethnically diverse in American history. Generation Z is also the most um, really interested in questions of social justice and environmental stuff. So overwhelmingly, Generation Z understands and agrees with and believes in climate change. So this is, you know, radically, they're a radically different generation than the politics of their generation is different than the politics of the context I, I've been raised in. And so tailoring what we're going to, what kinds of tools we're going to think about emboldening this generation with in order to engage is are di it's different than what maybe my generation needed. And so I think we really need to be cognizant of, of um, the, the, the fact that they need different tools than what we might have needed. Right, right. And so, you know, that really raises an interesting question about the Gen Z demographics and the messaging and the diversity. And so do you, do you have any thoughts about how we, how we talk about these issues across diversity issues and um, different groups. I mean, it, it seems like we all live in, I mean, between urban and rural and between genders and between, you know, our socioeconomic condition. I mean, these are all very complex issues. How do you think about that? Yeah. Um, so I, I write quite a bit about this in the book too, that the, the battle for the, the battle for airtime around our urgent issues, is deeply politicized, right? This is not about, whenever I see kind of the march for science or you know the sort of um, touting of climate scientists as being correct or this sort of um, um, these culture wars over what who gets to claim truth, I think one of the things that's underlying it that we need to really be cognizant of or be more critically thinking about is that these, these claims to truth, these power, these battles for power over who gets to say, what is the biggest thing we should be worrying about? These are very much embedded in current po political structures and, and power relationships. And so, for example, one of the people I spent a lot of time engaging with in my book is um, an indigenous scholar named Kyle Pallas White. And Kyle White does a lot of work on climate change and climate justice. And his argument, and I'm just giving you one example of an argument, um, his argument is that the claims for urgency, the claims for urgency around climate change, which is, of course, to harken back to Thunberg again, I want you to act like your house is on fire. That's a claim to urgency, right? The claim to urgency can have motivating effects, as we're seeing happen, but it can also, as we're also seeing happen, having have to bring out and exacerbate all of the existing inequalities that are already existing. And we're really seeing that happening with COVID. And so claims to urgency and the actions that can then therefore unfold from that can actually be quite regressive socially and, and, and add on to existing burdens. And I think um, that's one reason why we might want to step back from urgency claims in some situations in order to take the time and that pause and that space in between, and this is actually where I talk about mindfulness and Buddhist philosophy in the book, to take the pause that's required in between an, uh, receiving a message and then feeling urgency and then acting on urgency to really think about whose interests are being served by us acting out of urgency and whose interests are actually not being served and who might, whose interests might not be included in that. Um, urgency tends to make the dominant voices in the room win out, right? They tend to make the dominant voices who are saying, I'm in control and this is an urgent situation, so we're going to do it this way. And people tend to get in line with that, even though it tends to minimize and marginalize voices even further. And so th those are the kind, that's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, Mary Annalise Heglar, who's one of my favorite kind of climate um, thinkers right now, um, she also talks about, she has this wonderful letter to the climate movement in which she says, climate change is not the first existential threat. You know, let's try slavery, let's try colonialism. Um, and so the sense of, you know, I think a lot of times when the climate movement, when folks in the climate movement claim that this is the biggest existential threat of our time, it can be extremely divisive and it ignores that 
climate change is an extension of an existential threat that's been going on for lots of communities for a long time. And welcome, welcome to the world of climate trauma, right? So um, this has been happening. Oh, Lainia, you're muted. Okay, I'm back. Had some tech issues, but um, so Sarah, before we dive into some more of the um, the Q and A questions that are coming in, because we're getting a lot of really good questions, I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about your own personal practices of resilience during this time, and what are some of the things that you're doing for yourself. Yeah, well, I I have some I have some things I'm doing. We're we're all trying to figure out what we're doing, and I'm spending a lot of time asking my my students and my colleagues and my friends what they're doing. Um, and I, even though I feel fairly isolated from the worst of the situation, I mean, Humboldt County is not getting a ton of cases and, um, you know, we're not in a vulnerable demographic. And so far I haven't lost my job, although, you know, <laughs> but, you know, there's, there are some aspects to my situation that I, I can appreciate that I'm grateful for. However, it is. It would be absolutely crazy to think that all of this is going on in the world, and that we wouldn't be all experiencing some level of profound grief around what's happening. The millions of heartbreaks that we are experiencing all the time. I get this kind of feeling of vertigo when I think about from the smallest of little heartbreaks, like rising over the course of several weeks that she's. all going to come and proudly see them walk across the stage for you know first time in their family not being able to do that to the grief the real immediate grief of people losing loved ones who are you know dying alone across the world right the the levels of the scales and the and the levels of grief and the amount of it is impossible to contain and so i think the first thing that i'm trying to do and i would i find myself trying to help my students think about is to not expect just because you're at home and kind of pretending some sort of normalcy in your life that this is not sapping us and extremely traumatic to be thinking about all the time and we we it really does put into new light the extraordinary inequality in this country extraordinary inequality across the world and this and in one way that's good to bring those to light on the other hand the uncertainty about what the future is going to hold is is very enervating um psychically for us um and so some of the practices that I'm doing are um, really based in mindfulness and also just um, sort of self-care, basic practices of self-care. And I, I strongly feel that I do better if I have a somewhat of a routine. So I'm focusing really diligently on making myself have a routine that's really hard. These things, the most basic mundane things of normal daily life feel much harder in this context. And so I'm also um, exercise and trying to exercise. <laughs> and I try to wake up every morning and maybe with my oldest daughter or maybe alone, I try to ask myself some questions like, what are three things that we look forward to today? Because the day can drag on and they, they, they meld into each other and we can feel this kind of restlessness and sense of time being warped. And I think having markers of time when we can enjoy something that normally would have felt very mundane has been really important for us. So we will say lunch, lunch is something we're looking forward to, right? Or we're looking forward to smelling, you know, smelling that flower. We're gonna go on a walk and smell those flowers again, right? And so that, those are super mundane, but in a funny way, I think um, one of the things I talk about in the book too is this encounter with death or this encounter with grief actually enhances our ability to cherish the mundane sort of ephemerality of our, our, the lives that are right in front of us. And so while we're in the middle of this grief, while we're in the middle of this despair, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have also had a strong feeling of cherishing things that I otherwise ignore in my life. And that sort of grasping existential fleetingness of, of trying to constantly get to the next thing and constantly move sort of power through my day has has let off a bit and I'm, I'm slowing down and really being more present and I, it's, it's more accessible to me to do that under these circumstances and so I'm trying to enhance that. 
So I do things like ask myself some grounding questions and then I keep them, I keep those close. Like in the very beginning, I had to do a lot of grounding questions to help me hold on to things that, that I could hold, that I, that I wanted to grow, right? I wanted to write my list of what do I, what are the, I'm feeling a lot of acute anxiety. What instead do I want to grow, right? What do I want to grow that's going to take the place of this anxiety? And so answering that question for yourself is a super helpful thing. I've been doing that. What are the things I look forward to today? What are old habits and routines that I would like to give more attention to and intention to? What are the things that I get pleasure, small, small, small pleasure out of? And can I extract more pleasure out of them, like a nice shower? Um, you know, so things that are, that are really mundane, I'm trying to extract much more pleasure out of it and really focus on pleasure because it is a, a real act of labor, a, a real discipline to hold yourself from going down the rabbit hole of this anxiety. And it is utterly the most important thing we could be doing because if we're thinking that this is going to be the sort of new normal of our lives under climate change and climate disruption, we really do need to, now is the time for us to practice those skills that are gonna get us through and not just get us through, but maybe even enable us to thrive in a very different set situation than we have been used to in the past. So, right. hope that. Thank you for that. Um, okay, I think we're, we'll move to some of the questions that have been coming in. And um, I know this one is close to your heart and something that, that you will have something to say about. Um, did you write or think about the choice to not have children as another symptom of climate anxiety and eco grief? <laughs> yes, um, yes, and I there are some some wonderful people who are really tackling that question right now, um, and I'm engaged in talking to them about it. It's very interesting. You know, um, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez made that comment last year about. Um, being, she said something like it's legitimate to, to reconsider having children in, in a state of climate change. And this was pre-COVID, right? So she got a lot of pushback for that. And I, I, I thought to myself, well, that's just what her generation has been. She's just speaking what her generation's all been thinking. And I think there is a real, a really interesting shift happening here. In the past, the question of whether to reproduce has been very charged in environmental discussions. So a woman's decision to, to be able to um, reproduce or not reproduce has always been tied up in environmental conversations. It's been since, I mean, you can even go back to, in historically in the US, you can even go back to thinking about the early eugenics movement has been tied to early conservation efforts too, whereby the thought of who's supposed to be reproducing in the world and what kinds of people we should have in the world are directly to, tied to these kinds of utopic ideas about what kind of environment we want to live in and who should have access to resources and that kind of thing. And so um, I think that's a really charged question and a really charged discussion. And I find it interesting that the tone has shifted in the last couple of years from young women or women thinking about not having children um, because they didn't want to add to population growth. So that was a real thing in, in sort of 1970s environmentalism in the U.S. was to try to, you know, participate in the zero population growth, growth movement. And that also had another arm that was very anti-immigration too, like let's keep the population growth in the U.S. from growing, not just on the planet. And that political choice to not have a child was usually tied to thinking that you were going to do your part to not add to the population growth. That is now a very different, that's not, no longer what young women are thinking about. They're thinking about a far more kind of, sort, I don't know if you want to call it selfish, but like, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that it's your own, that your child that you'd raise into this world would not have the planet look or feel like, and that they're going to have so much chaos and uncertainty, and, and there's no guarantee that they would have a life that you might have had or whatever those kinds of myths are that we that that make us want to have children in the first place um, is really the reason why you see the movement of the birth strikers going on and lots of people saying I'm not going to bring a child onto this planet you know it's a very different argument than I don't want to add to population growth and I think that we need to listen to that that's that is a, a, um, that's a marked shift and that's a gives you a real testament a real flavor of the difference between what the Generation Z is worrying about versus what, you know, boomers or me, like Generation X, have been thinking about re regarding environmental choices. 
Right. And I want to add to that if I can. If I can, I just have that thought too. Um, one of the things that I think is super interesting and exciting to think about in terms of what's on the horizon here for us in this moment, young people are also actively rethinking relationships of care and kin. And they're doing this by living in cooperatives. They're doing this by thinking differently about divisions of labor. They're doing this by understanding that the capitalist economy, the way it's been working, hasn't been good for families. They're also looking and analyzing how the nuclear family model, the kind of heteronormative nuclear family model, is actually really bad for the environment. So this notion that the sort of, you know, at the household level or at the nuclear household level, we're all going to solve the environmental problem, this feels not like the right answer to this generation. And so I love thinking about how this generation is going to help us redefine and usher forth new relationships with kinship and care and family life and labor around caregiving and sexuality. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm excited to see what happens when they, you know, when this comes, when they grow into adulthood with these new uh, hopes for relationships. Oh, I really love that. And, you know, that's something that I think about a lot and have experience with too. So um, I love rethinking those kinship and what that can look like. Um, here's another question that I think is really interesting. It's one that's been coming up a lot in conversation around COVID. Um, how do the inadvertent positive environmental effects of the pandemic affect people's feelings of self or group efficacy? So could this period help to jumpstart the, jump the changes in lifestyle that have been needed? Mm. Ooh, that's a good yeah. question. <laughs> and Lena, we've talked about this, so you know I have thoughts about this. Um, so yeah, I think um, there is a yes and there's a there's a good and bad here. Okay, so I'm I'm not prescribing one way or the other. I think it's important to be nuanced about this. The positive environmental effects that we're seeing, what they're doing is they're showing what happens when the existing situation of a fuel-based economy has to be paused. What, but that is unfortunately, and that's great, right? And that can exactly what the, the person who wrote the question suggested, that can potentially tip the scales in some of these changes that have been kind of lining up. We have the technology, we just don't have the political will. Maybe this is gonna push the, the kind of bottleneck on political will into enabling some of these technologies to be more widely disseminated. So there's all kinds of potentials there. And I agree with that. However, we don't, we, while we're doing that, while we're advocating for that, while we're seeing what's possible, right? This exciting, like what's possible if we take all the cars off the road, wow. Um, while we're thinking about that though, we also want to be very careful to not just get caught up in this kind of Cartesian um, trope of environmentalism, which has been a longstanding trope in environmentalism to situate humanity as the virus on the planet. Like this is somehow the planet's way to inoculate itself against humanity. That is a super dangerous argument to be making. And I would caution us not to be making that argument. This is not about humanity being inherently evil and the planet having some intention of punishing us. Gaia is coming out to, you know, take revenge. That is a very dangerous argument. And the reason why it's dangerous is, for, is multifold. First of all, it doesn't, help us take advantage of the benefits that we're seeing in these in these ways right we can we can we could take advantage of the changes we're having like this the writer suggested without going down that path we don't have to make that argument and that argument has the, neg the unintended consequences of um not attending to the extreme variety of different types of human con contribution to this and that some types of people are suffering much more from climate change than others and while some benefit from it and other the, meanwhile still other people have for millennia and for their entire traditional lives lived in great harmony with the environment right and in fact enhancing the environment so the wide variety of whether or not humans are good for the environment is is so complex and so wide and it, it totally deals with questions of social justice and identity and these of those things or else we're going to clump all humans into one category as evil. It's not humans that are evil. It's structures that can be changed, right? We can't just wipe the planet from humans, but we can question 
whether or not cap the capitalism as we know it should be changed. We can think about alternative technologies. We can, there are, we can rethink public health systems, right? Those are things we can actually do in our lifetime. And that feels far more effective than thinking about humanity being evil and we should just get rid of humanity. Also, it has the effect of ignoring the ways that um, human beings, uh, you know, hu that um, human beings can think about their participate that the, the powerless powerlessness issue I was talking about earlier. One of the arguments I want to really bring forth is from the book is that when we think about climate change as a problem, when we think about the planet having this is a amorphous big thing as being the sort of source of the problem, we don't we it makes it hard to see the places where humans can have agency because they think of it as being sort of this natural disaster. It's sort of like the analogy is the natural disaster, right? This natural disaster is happening out there and humans can't do anything about it. But we all know darn well, and everybody who you know in fire sure knows, that these things are not natural disasters. Hurricanes are not natural disasters. Fire is not a natural disaster. In fact, we can't even, we, we might want to call it a weather event, but if you think about how humans have shaped weather, we can't even really call that natural anymore. And also, the ways that we have constructed infrastructure to be resilient to or not around a natural disaster, the decisions we've made to eliminate fire from our practices, the decisions we've made to put housing and, you know, build things in, in not fire good ways, right? These are the kinds of decisions that humans can undo and change and make different and, and have a much better relationship with the environment. So this humanity is evil is a very self-fulfilling prophecy and it's, it's quite dangerous and it can, it can, make it really impossible to see how some people do have lived very well with nature and maybe we should think about taking some notes from them and pay more attention to for example indigenous people's climate practices um, and also how it is that some people are going to be suffering from these problems a lot more that far more than is proportionate to how they participated in them right it's exactly because in the same way as like the issues you talk about with climate and kind of the disproportionate effects on folks we see that with covid too and you know the the economic impact of this crisis right now is having different effects on different people and so it does feel a little um shallow to to talk about the environmental benefits when we know people are losing jobs and lives and livelihoods. yeah and i think I think it's um I think the focus on that is it's the people's desire to to see a silver lining and that's and, and given how, how we're feeling, of course that's a that's I can understand that. But I do think that the environmental reasons, the environmental injustice that causes so much of this underlying conditions that are therefore making certain populations more vulnerable to COVID, that may be I mean that's not a silver lining at all, but we should be paying more attention to that than just thinking about how great the air is right now. Um, the air is so great, but in the, when the air wasn't good, it was affecting certain people much worse, and now they're dying in greater numbers from COVID. Right. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about, um, one of the questions relates to talking with youth about this, and you've talked about kind of that climate generation and you know, teenagers, maybe 20 year olds, but what about little kids? Like, how should we be talking about these issues with, with our children and with other young children? Mm. Yeah, uh, I love that question. Um, I think that there are, I know that there are people out there who are in the middle of trying to write these books, like Ellen Kelsey, the woman I just described, she's in the process of writing two books about talking about climate with children. So I know there are experts on this that are much better equipped. And I sometimes think to myself, just give me the college students. I can't deal with these young people. And I have two little ones. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. So I should, I, I have felt that I needed to come up with an answer to this question. And I, my real feeling about this and um, the, the negative, the doom and gloom, the world's all dying. We have to save it. You've heard me say it already. It's not effective for, for people who already know that. And it's particularly destructive for young people. I, it's my belief. And I think the most important thing that we can do with young people is feed what you want them to grow. I keep coming back to that. It's like a mantra for me, right? So what do we want them to love? Not what do we want them to fear? Well, we want them to love the interconnections between humans and the environment and to see those better. We want them to love beauty. We want them to love all kinds, I mean, answer that quite wonder, 
awe, um, you know, a sense of community. Uh, what are those things that we want them to love? And and all what we can do is teach to the extent that we know those the answers to those questions around human interconnections of the environment, just enhance those and teach them those things and, and just fill them up with those things because they will need to be, be they need they need to be they need to grow in themselves a huge profound appreciation for these interrelationships and community and uh, ecosystems before we can then ask them to turn around when they're a little bit more mature and they have their prefrontal cortex fully developed to think about how do they then protect that which is that, that which they love. So I strongly believe that building that love, building that awareness, building that appreciation takes center stage to any of the it's under threat stuff. And I think it's, I think, you know, I've really, I know this sounds bad for maybe coming from me, but I've actually really tried to protect my kids from the negative aspects of what I've been writing about and thinking about, although they kind of know, of course they know, right? Um, but I, but we try to spend more airtime to the stuff that we want to grow. It's like fertilizer and sunlight and water on our garden, where you put the where you put that stuff, that where you put that attention and that intention and your words and your time and your effort and your and the way you walk your life, that stuff is going to grow. I really like that. Um, along those same lines, there's a question about: Do you know of any groups that are out there to help children deal with climate grief, like official? Did you find any in your research? Mm, that is such a good question. Um, I. I don't know about groups, although I, that makes me want to go look it up. So I'm going to go look that up. But I know for sure that for non-children, <laughs> that the Good Grief Network is super, this, there's a climate anxiety kind of 10-step program that I would strongly recommend. And they also do a teacher training system so they can teach people to then build those kinds of support groups in their communities. Um, so I know that's happening for sure around eco-grief and climate anxiety. For young people, the book I really like for thinking about parenting in this time, which I know that's not everybody on, who is listening, but for parenting around the, on these issues, Mary DeMocker's book, which is called A Parent's Guide to the Climate Revolution or something like that, is a fantastic book. It's not a group, it's not a group, but it is it's super smart about developing skills with young people for resilience and for surviving this for the long haul for the lifetimes and not just being like how's how you recycle something right um and i think she, that book is very very smart and i would recommend people check that book out if they want to think about how to approach this with their with their younger children okay, that's mary great. demacher yeah wonderful um here's another question it's kind of a a, a change in direction um Regarding pseudo inefficacy in and attending to the stranglehold that right wing minority parties have on political systems worldwide, what advice do you have for cultivating a belief in perceived efficacy in the face of such thoroughly entrenched authoritarian power? Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> that's a doozy. You're getting some hard, getting some hard questions. That's here. a doozy. Yeah. Oh, denial. Um, no, that's not a strategy. <laughs> I, I, there are days, there are days. Okay, so um, there's, I mean, I can't pretend that anything I can offer is going to help with that. I think that's super frightening. I, I, I find it, I find it more frightening in some ways than climate change. Um, so let me, let me try to think this through out loud. One of the things in my book I spend a lot of time talking about is that if you look at a more nuanced analysis of who's out there, you might realize that the way media presents things is in really strong polls, right? I mean, that's saying, I know that maybe you probably knew, know that, but if you really dig into the research about these polls and what's actually out there, there is far more nuance and far more gray areas between the polls and even not off these polls, right? That than what we would might believe from what media, what we're, what we're digesting in media. And so one strategy, and it's not denial, but it's aware, greater awareness and greater focus on the many, 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 many people who aren't in that category and thinking collectively about how better to organize with them. They're just, so many more people 
who, than we might think, who feel that that is really alarming and want to do something about them. And so we really don't have a choice other than to find those people and organize with them. I mean, we, we can't just, denial really is, is not going to work. Um, the second strategy that I would suggest along those lines, besides becoming more aware of the variety of people's politics out there, the sort of polls, you know, dig more deeply into who, who's really out there, what their values really are. The second thing is that I do think one of the things that's come out of the current authoritarian moves I've seen that we've all been watching happen is this, I feel more strongly than I ever have before, and this might be an unpopular statement, with my audience, I'm not sure. I feel more strongly before that we need to reinvest in and redevelop and really work hard to protect institutions of democracy. And so I am feeling that democracy is one of the only, um, only bastions to defend against the, what, what, I'm, what we're seeing happen. And so in some ways, perhaps the most important thing we can do to address climate injustice is to invest in democracy. And that means investing in existing institutions, some existing institutions, these things need to be institutionalized. And so um, I know that it's popular to sort of have an anarchist view about, you know, fixing the climate problems. But I do think that democracy is a, a effective strategy at this. It's just the people are gonna feel that that's too slow. And like I said earlier, I have my concerns about urgency. You know, so democracy, if you're going to do this in a way that's not authoritarian, because you could equally have an authoritarian situation around climate change, right? You could have an authoritarian come in and say, we're going to fix climate change, and here's how we're going to do it. And I'm not, I wouldn't prefer that either. So um, I, I feel that if we have to sit there and make a choice between social justice and liberty versus the, saving the climate, that I, I, I'm of the belief, and I, this might be unpopular for some people, that we, we can't just go ram, 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 run ramshot over humanity to get to what, who do we, who, whose idea of climate perfection? I'm, I'm not sure I could trust that. So, wow. not a great answer. <laughs> I thought it was a great answer to a, a very complex question. Um, That's and a hard so question. While we're on the track of thinking about institutions and um, things like that, there, there are a couple questions about the educational system. This question, um, how do you think educational institutions and the educational system overall, particularly in the U.S., need to shift in order to address the challenges of climate change? So in other words, how would you reimagine education itself so that all students have the opportunities for environmental learning and action that your students are so lucky to have? <laughs> wow. Oh, geez. Oh, so many things need to change. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how much something like, I don't know, 80 something percent, I don't, don't quote me, go look it up, but some huge number of parents want their children to learn about climate change in this country, which is really interesting when you look at the statistics around how many Americans are concerned about climate change, which is far less. So that's interesting. But so you can imagine this opens the door for introducing climate change at, all, at the K through 12 level and all through. Um, so I do see that's actually happening. This is really happening pretty strongly in California with the next generation curriculum, but that's not, that's not the end of it, right? I mean, the, the fundamental problem of, of public education or, higher, or uh, the school system is that it hasn't been able to adequately address the structural reasons for climate change. So to, to teach climate change, it's not enough to say, here's how climate change works and it's happening and, you know, here emissions are causing it and we need to selectively think about how we're going to reduce emissions. The next, the implied next, next argument is the structures that we know are going to fundamentally have to change. And Kari Norgaard, a sociologist, an environmental sociologist and a mentor, a dear friend of mine, she has observed, she's a sociologist, she observed that more Americans can imagine the end of the world than they can imagine a post-fossil economy, post-fossil fuel economy. And that is that lack of imagination, the fact that we, that we can't imagine what life would be after fossil fuel, we're much more likely to imagine the, a total like asteroid apocalypse because of, I don't know, because of, of, uh, of the 
fiction we consume, the sci-fi we consume. I don't know why this is possible, but with in, in schools, we really need to cultivate that ima imagination. We need to be thinking about and teaching young people how to build the world that they want instead. Because just learning about climate change doesn't do anything for efficacy, doesn't do anything for the imagination of what else could be possible. And we can't, we simply cannot manifest the world that we want to and the next generation is never going to be able to if they can't imagine what it looks like and how it's structured. Right. Okay. Can I talk about um, a question that is oh. about climate change being polarizing? I'm seeing a question pop up from Yana that I really want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. About, sure. It says, are there other ways to motivate action without using the climate or climate change language since it be, can be so polarizing? Are there other terms that resonate more broadly? And I think this is this really comes back to COVID for me. Um, I love this question. So Catherine Hayhoe, the woman I quote in the book who talks about make drawing connections and connecting the dots for people who are like fundamentally anti-climate change. So the people who study climate psychology and climate communication and politics of climate in the US have discovered that it's not so much that climate change itself is the problem, it's the fact that climate change is something that their peers and their the messenger, they care more about the messenger, they care about more about whether or not it fits into a category of the rest of the politics they care about. So if I'm anti-abortion, then I'm also gonna be anti-climate change regardless, right? There's sort of this, but the partisanship thing has, has made politics so black and white. So, those folks have just have these folks are arguing like per Espen Stokes and Kari Norgard and um, Anthony Lyserowitz and a, a bunch of people who are much smarter than I am have have argued David Pello that the way to get people to talk about, to care about climate change is to maybe even ditch the term entirely and I, I I'm so totally for that because for the, like I said to you earlier climate change is imperceptible by its definition, we perceive weather, we don't perceive climate change, right? We have to look back at records to perceive climate change. Our bodies don't feel it. It's what philosophers call phenomenology. The phenomenology is that we don't feel it phenomenologically in our bodies. So by, by its definition, climate change is kind of doomed to get on people's radars. So again, yeah, let's call it by its other names. Let's call it by pandemic. Let's call it a pandemic. Let's call it extreme weather events. Let's call it fire seasons are changing. Let's call it, you know, public health crisis. Because those are actually things that we can tackle and do something about. And we feel them and we perceive them and they feel like actual risks and threats. And so the risk perception aspect of climate change is a fundamental loser to begin with. But if we call it by some other name, absolutely. People are more likely to perceive it as a threat. And it, in fact, is those other things. That's great. Yeah, I love that question too, um, Yana, because we work so much as extension professionals and, and people who work in fire, we're always looking for those cross sections and trying to overcome party lines and politics and, you know, deal with these issues that affect all of us and not be so polarizing. And um, it's great to, to have your thoughts on that. Um, we have about five more minutes, and there's one question I really want to honor because it's from someone in Pakistan, and I think it's really a, an interesting question. So I think we'll ask that, and then um, I apologize because it, we have more questions than we can answer with the time that we have. Um, so this is from Isan in Pakistan. I make journeys to high mountain glaciers quite often. Every time I'm there, I feel overwhelmed because I do not know what to feel, whether I should feel hopeful or panic. Then secondly, what is my role as an environmentalist in saving these glaciers, considering there are indigenous communities already living there? I do feel a strong connection to these sites, but how do you bring change without being imposing or violent toward these communities? How do you work in collaboration to change things as an academic or outsider? Wow. Um, I really love that. I'm. I'm I'm drawn to the first part of the question, and I know that the second part is really what this person would like me to answer more. <laughs> but the, so I'll start with the first part a little bit. Um, the hope and despair, the hope and sadness combination that this person feels on the glacier, that I think one of the things I, I really have learned myself and would love to share, and I write about it in the book quite a bit, is that the feelings of being secure and stable and okay and hopeful those aren't going to necessarily be as possible anymore. And, and in fact, really, this is where I take for myself a leaf from Buddhist philosophy that impermanence is just 
part of life and that the, the faster I can kind of reckon with the death of all this, the death around us, the faster I can actually not be so paralyzed by my, my worry about it and just do the work. Um, accepting this, right? And so in some funny way, I'm, I'm drawing actually from somebody who, who that person might be familiar with who's written a book called The End of Ice. Um, that's Dar Jamail, and Dar Jamail writes in The End of Ice, the subtitle of which is Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. He talks about grief as a necessity for honoring suffering. Grief is the opposite of hope, but perhaps counterintuitively, it's more important, a more important affect for doing the existential work of facing climate disruption. Whereas hope is often sought as a distraction from the gravity of what's going on, for Jamail, as he writes, it is a, willing, a willingness to live without hope allows me to accept the heartbreaking truth of our situation, however calamitous it is. Grieving for what is happening to the planet also now brings me gratitude for the smallest, most mundane things. Grief is also a way to honor what we are losing. My acceptance of our pro probable decline opens up a more intimate and heartfelt union with life itself. Grief has allowed him to fall in love with the earth in a way he never thought possible. And I think that I just wanted to speak to you and honor the initial feeling, the affect that this person described as being on the glacier because that particular book really blew my mind and I wanted to share that. Um, in terms of how to address this stuff, I think uh, I fundamentally don't know anything about the situation of the indigenous people who are living in this glacier and what you're trying to do there. But um, having lived in Alaska where there's glaciers, <laughs> Um, I, I have, you know, I'm really moved by Julie Crickshed's book, Glaciers Listen, and I, I do, I am aware that indigenous knowledge about climate change and glaciers is far more deep and profound and instructive than the current science of happening, or, and now increasingly they are working together, right, Western science and indigenous knowledge about the glaciers are working together. And so I'm not, I'm not, I can't speak to how, how effective it is or not effective, or if it feels like um, it's being, it's respectfully including traditional ecological knowledge in that situation. But I do think um, that the evidence is becoming clearer and clearer that traditional ecological knowledge is, has been good for the environment and that we really ought to be prioritizing it in the work that we're doing. So I'm not, I don't know the nuances of the, your particular situation, but I, I think that that the evidence out there on that is, is pretty powerful. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we are out of time. It's 1030 and that flew by because Sarah, you are such a dynamic and sharp and amazing person. I'm so grateful to know you. Um, I, before people get off, I did want to say, I put in the chat box two different things. Um, one is that if you want to order this book, you can order it from Northtown Books in Arcata, California. You can find them online. Christina put the, the link in the chat. Um, and Sarah is donating all the proceeds to, from her book sales to the bookstore. Um, they're a great local bookstore that we really appreciate here in Arcata. Um, the other thing is that we'll be having a, um, a conversation that Vivian Gerstein, who is a friend of ours and a high school student, will be hosting with Sarah to talk about um, all of these issues in the context of being a high schooler and, and some of the issues that they're dealing with at that age group. So that'll be on May 6th at 10 a.m. and we will, um, Pacific time, and we will send that out to everyone. I have all of your emails, so um, you'll get notification about that. So I just want to thank Sarah again um, so much for everything you're doing. I can't wait to finish the book myself. And thank you to Yana for saving me during my tech issue and to Mike Jones for doing all the tech behind the scenes. Um, and to all of you for being here. This was excellent and uh, so honored to, to be able to host this today. So be well, and um, hopefully we'll see you on May 6th. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>